Welcome to Goobertown Hobbies, my name is Brent. Dungeons & Dragons is finally getting customizable hard plastic minis. In a previous video I built and painted a few of these. This plastic is my favorite material to work with, and I love that D&D players are getting more options. Today we're gonna play with more models from this Frameworks line. In particular, we're gonna talk about this expensive crew of kobolds, and this expensive crew of orcs. I think these kits are going to have a big effect on the future of D&D minis, and I want to talk about them. Full disclosure, WizKid sent me all of these models for free, ahead of release, as review stock. That being said, I'm under no obligations. I think some of these minis are expensive, but basically worth it. Some of them are expensive and not quite worth it, and some of these were priced by an absolute madman. I think the best value are the player characters. In the US, these are $15. That's more than the cost of lunch, but less than two lunches. They're nice models, they have fun options, and you'll probably get a lot of use out of them. They're expensive, but I'm guessing that they'll sell decently well. Then there are the monsters. Many of these are priced at $25. I feel like these are a bit overpriced, but then again, some people really love beholders, and some people really love driders. I'm happy for those folks who are going to get a cool new model for their favorite monster. Okay, and then we have the multi-packs. There's a pack of 7 orcs for $50, and there's a pack of 7 kobolds for $50. That's a lot of lunch. This is shocking, and confusing, and fascinating. Let's build these and paint these and give them a fair chance. This isn't going to be an angry review or anything like that. The emotion I'm feeling is curiosity. Not many folks are going to buy 7 kobolds for $50. I'm one of the few people on Earth who will ever use this model kit, so let's crack it open and see what we've got. Welcome to Kobold Talk Episode 1. My name is Brent. The kobold kit has 7 sprues. Each sprue has enough bits to build one kobold. Each sprue has one set of torso, legs, feet, and tail. There are two left arms, two right arms, and two heads. And there's a couple of little knickknacks for the bases. The box has 7 clear bases and 5 pages of instructions. The instructions are for building kobolds 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is when I realized that the 7 sprues weren't all different. There are 5 unique sprues, with an extra kobold number 2 and an extra kobold number 4. I have no idea why these two were duplicated instead of any of the others. The good news is that one of the duplicate sprues has the option for a kobold holding a scorpion. That's the best bit in the box, so I'm happy to have two of them. The sprue frames are designed with these standoffs in the corners so that they can be stacked and not damaged in the box. I like this little feature. I found that two stacks of five could easily fit in the box along with the bases and instructions. So WizKids could have duplicated all five kobolds and sold them as a pack of ten. This would have made a lot of sense because there are ten different heads and ten different pairs of arms. I'm kind of baffled by the choice to sell a pack of 7 sprues with two of those being duplicates. Does the number 7 have some significance in D&D gameplay that I'm not aware of? I don't know. Anyway, here's the breakdown of the kobolds. Legs, feet, torso, and tail are all non-negotiable. All 10 of the heads are interchangeable and somewhat poseable. The arms all have a nice clean joint at the shoulder, so the arms are all interchangeable and somewhat poseable too. Each model comes with a mound of dirt for the figure to stand on to make the base more interesting. I prefer models without this, but some people like them. The sprues have a handful of extra bits, and they're all jars. There's a gimmick that the dungeon master can number the kobolds based on the number of jars or urns glued to their base. So Magnus, the human fighter, can say that they're attacking kobold 3. And everybody is clear that Magnus is attacking the kobold with 3 jars glued to the base. So there's a ton of empty space on these sprues, and a lot of the bits that are included are just tiny jars and urns. Some of the player character minis had unique and interesting bits, but these kobolds all just have jars and urns. This sprue could have had two kobolds worth of bits on it, or at least some better extras. Instead, we have tiny jars. Anyway, I got them built, and all seven of them fit there in the palm of my hand. Kobolds are small humanoids. These minis are scaled correctly. They match with a kobold that I have from the old D&D minis game. Correct scale or not, this is priced at $50. This is kind of a feel-bad moment right here. 
It's hard for people to get excited about polystyrene minis when this is the kind of deal that's on offer. It sounds kind of silly, but I think that this Kobold kit is going to have a long-term effect on the future path of D&D minis. We'll get these painted up and take a better look at them in just a minute, but first, let's build the orcs. The orc kit is also 7 models. Orcs are medium-sized humanoids, and this kit clearly has more mass. Again, this kit is 5 different models with 2 duplicates. One of the orcs is special and is spread across two sprues, because he has options for a cape and larger weapons. Again, the legs and torso are standard, and each orc has a choice of two left arms, two right arms, and two heads. Unlike the kobolds, the heads and arms are not all interchangeable. Many of them are keyed to only fit with the torso from the same sprue. These models do have a few seams that aren't hidden very well, but I was able to assemble them and make them look pretty good. I was disappointed that some of the poses don't take advantage of being multi-part kits. A few of these have flat poses that look like they would work well as a single-piece cast. This stance with the arms out to either side is a classic look for single-piece minis. This orc model could be part of the Nulzer's Marvelous Miniatures line, or even a Ralpartha metal mini. I'm a bit disappointed that two of this particular sprue came in the box. These poses where the characters are holding their arms out in front of them are more three-dimensional, and they're a better use of multi-part kits. The kobolds had the jars as a numbering gimmick, and the orcs have pointy sticks. We have the option to glue pointy sticks to the orc bases in order to number them. I'm not going to do that, though. The practical result here is that we have a lot of pointy sticks, and not much variety for cool extra bits. The orcs also have the option for plastic dirt and rocks on their bases, but I didn't use them. The supplied bases are clear, but there's no reason that we can't paint them. Each clear base says Made in China, and that kind of interferes with the point of having clear bases. Alrighty, let's get them painted. I decided to base my paint schemes off of a combination of my old pre-painted D&D minis and the 5th edition monster manual. The kobolds will be this orangey color with dark spots, and the orcs will be a variety of colors that I'll dull down with a brown wash. I primed them all with red-brown. This will look like blood if it's underneath flesh, and it'll look like rust if it's underneath metal. And this shade of brown can look natural for wood, cloth, leather, and dirt. So yeah, this review isn't meant to be mean or angry, I'm just fascinated by the price tag on these kits. I'm curious about what chain of events could have possibly led to $50 for 7 kobolds. $7.14 for each one of these little buddies. WizKids is the same company that produces Nulzer's Marvelous Miniatures. Those Nulzer's packs are a pretty good value, and they're great for encouraging new painters to get into the hobby. I like that WizKids has options at different price points. Nulzer's is the cheaper option, but if you're willing to spend more, you can get something from the Frameworks line. But wow, did WizKids miss with the price on these. Lots of companies are selling plastic orcs on polystyrene sprues. Let's do a quick rundown of the competition. Warlord Games has 24 orcs for $32. That's $1.33 each. Kings of War has 20 orcs for $35. That's $1.75 each. Kings of War also has some specialty squads of 10 for $35, so $3.50 each. Conquest has a couple of very cool modular orc kits of 12 models for $43. So that's $3.58 per orc. Even the prices for Warhammer models look okay in this comparison. Savage orcs are $2.70 per model. The brand new and overpriced gut rippers are $5 per model. And then Frameworks is coming in at more than $7 per orc. These are decent models, but they're also priced about two times higher than they should be. The Framework sprues do have the Dungeons and Dragons logo stamped on them. But we know from the Nulzer's line that the IP license isn't that expensive. As for kobolds, I think there's less competition on the market for kobold models than there is for orc models. But still, these Reaper Bones kobolds are about $1 per model, and they're not too bad. It's also interesting to me that the orcs and kobolds are the same price. Ordinarily, I'd expect little kobolds to be cheaper than big orcs. The orcs are overpriced, so I think that makes the kobolds extremely overpriced. 
Now from one point of view, they have a similar number of bits, and it probably took the designers a similar amount of labor to make each of these kits. The cost of polystyrene is negligible. And yet, I think painters and gamers expect bigger models to be more expensive than smaller models. If we look at the pricing model from Games Workshop, for $50 you can get 10 gut rippas, or you can get 20 of the smaller Hobgrot slitas. Intuitively, smaller models should be cheaper, and more of them should come in a box. There's an interesting discussion to be had about how much D&D players are willing to spend on minis. D&D can be played for essentially the cost of a player's handbook and a set of dice. But then folks start buying fancy dice, and dice trays, and more books, and mahogany DM screens, and minis. And there's a handful of goobers with a room full of dwarven forged terrain, and minis for the whole monster manual. In my experience, it seems like the median D&D player has two books, three sets of dice, and a couple of minis that they haven't painted yet. I'm not sure that this crowd is ready to spend $50 on seven kobolds. I come from the Warhammer side of the mini painting hobby, and because of that, I'm normally pretty good at rationalizing expensive plastic minis. But yeah, $50 for seven kobolds is beyond my abilities to explain or comprehend. I was really excited about the Frameworks line, modular hard plastic minis for the D&D crowd. That's a great opportunity to get more people hooked on mini painting, and I'm all for anything that can grow the hobby. But these kobolds make me wonder about the future of the Frameworks line, and the future of D&D minis in general. Ordinarily, I wouldn't make a video about decent but overpriced minis. But this kobold kit boggles the mind, and I just had to talk about it. I really think this pricing blunder is gonna go down in D&D history or become a meme or something. It sticks in the brain. It's bad enough optics that it could sink the whole line of minis. I don't want frameworks to crash and burn. I want it to be cheaper, and I want it to be successful. I want more options for minis to paint, and I want more friends to paint with. But, based on the pricing, I think frameworks could be a dud. If the line struggles, or if it's a commercial failure, Kobolds are gonna be the face of that failure. That's such a silly thing to say, but I think it's true. Polystyrene minis for D&D is big news. To an extent, the success of the Frameworks line is gonna depend on the public perception of the most overpriced kits. The future of plastic D&D minis depends on kobolds. And you gotta admit, that's pretty funny. Of course, everybody has different finances. If you're willing to spend some cash and get some minis that nobody else is going to have, then by all means go for it. If one of these minis is calling out to you, then that's awesome. You know what you've got to do. But I've got a feeling that most people are going to see the price tag and say heck no. I feel a bit special that I might be one of the only people to ever paint these minis. They didn't even use painted minis on the box art, they just colored in the renders of the 3D sculpts. I hope the artists who designed these minis do get a chance to see some people actually paint them. Regardless of price, I'm having fun building and painting these minis, and I'm finding a lot of details that I really like. That scorpion alone is earning a lot of goodwill. Now, a few of the joints are a bit wonky. I think the orc heads should be bigger relative to the bodies, and the kobold sprues being filled with jars and urns was pretty lame, but overall these are nice models. The orcs aren't better than all of the other plastic orcs on the market, but they're a decent option and it's nice to have choices. The sculptors did a pretty good job. I've gotten many hours of entertainment out of these, and they'll look good on a game board. I'm still mystified at the choice to put seven models in each box. If you have five different sprues, it seems like the box size should be either five or ten models. Seven minis, including two repeats, is madness. It shows that you need duplicates in order to get up to 7 minis, and it also shows that you're too cheap to just include a duplicate of all 5 of the sculpts. It's madness! Additionally, the person pricing these kits really should have taken a look at what their competitors were charging. They're trying to sell plastic minis at a higher price than even Games Workshop minis, and they're trying to sell them to customers who are not accustomed to Games Workshop prices. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's gonna work. Of course, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe these kits do sell well. Maybe hyper-expensive plastic minis become standard for D&D games. Either way, I think these kobolds are going to have a big influence on the future of plastic D&D minis. And that's pretty funny. Oh hey, the minis are painted. 
I normally use bright colors on my models, but it was a nice change of pace to use the drab schemes from the monster manual. I think these came together pretty well. Thanks again to WizKids for sending these minis to me as review stock ahead of release. They have confidence that their products will speak for themselves, and I really respect that. If you're someone who's not too worried about price, then hey, these kits are pretty good. Well that's it for this episode of Kobold Talk. Thank you all so much for watching.